So we are still in the topic of IV regression and today we're gonna just finish this topic. Uh, so, we're just left with two important points to cover. And these two important points are related to the estimation of the two stage least square coefficient and the estimation of the standard error of the coefficient. So, in any estimation methodology, we always uh, kind of looking for the best linear unbiased estimator, right? And the best linear unbiased estimator, you can think of it as looking at the coefficients estimated, estimated and the variance of coefficients. So you have like two things. And as you know, like when you think about it in terms of the t-statistic, you always have like the coefficient here. So you have, let's say, beta hat j minus beta over the standard error of beta hat j, where this standard error, you know, it's equal to the standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. Okay, so we are always looking for these two components and we need to know um, what happened every time I'm estimating a coefficient, what happened to the coefficients and what happened to the standard error or the variance of the coefficient. Um, we know that the OLS assumes that we have the best linear unbiased estimator under the group of assumptions that we know. When I talk about the estimated coefficients, I talk about the betas or the numerator of the t-statistic, and I want these coefficients to be unbiased and consistent. Right? And I hope when I talk about the variance is I have the lowest possible variance, right? Because the, when I talk about the best estimator is the one that is unbiased, consistent, and has the lowest variance out of all possible coefficients I can get. Okay, so in today's lecture, we're going to talk about these two components. We're going to talk about the coefficients estimated and the variance of the coefficients estimated. We're going to be comparing two things. We're going to be comparing um, OLS versus the uh, two stage least squares. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the two coefficients estimated under the coefficients estimated under the two uh, methodologies and also the variances estimated under the two methodologies. I'm going to start first with the variance because it's um, relatively uh, easier and then I'm going to go into the estimated coefficients because it's relatively more um, challenging and taking more time. So let's start with the relatively um, easier one. Can I just ask a quick question? Yes, sure. I know you mentioned last class that we were going to be seeing this data code for what we did last yeah. time. Yes. Um, will you be showing that to us at the end of this class or? Yes. Mm -hmm. okay. That's you. my plan. Mm -hmm. So uh, I want you to recall. Okay, so we're going to start with uh, the variance. I want you to recall that in OLS, we said many times that the variance of beta hat j is equal to the sum of the squared residuals over the sample size minus how many axes I'm estimating minus the intercept over the variance of xj, okay? Um, and just, uh, I want you to remember this, it's not needed now, but just remember that we said that uh, if I have multicollinearity, so this is just for you to 
Remember that we said this variance can be written as beta hat j equal s s r n minus k minus one. Same, just repeat of xj, but it's multiplied by the VIF variance inflation factor. So one over one minus r square j. Okay, and this one is the part that we call the VIF. Okay, now when um, I talk about the IV estimation. In the IV estimation, so in the IV uh, methodology, we have the variance of beta hat g is equal to the sum of the square residuals over n minus k minus one over the variance of x. However, this one is multiplied times the r square of x over, when it's regressed over z, the instrument, okay? So this r square is coming from the regression of x on the iv uh, uh, instrumental variable or z, okay? So I'm sure that um, you can imagine that if this one, like if this r square is equal to one, if, I, if this one is equal to one, which is the perfect explanation of the iv estimator to uh, x, then I go back to the variance of OLS. So just notice this. If X, let's talk about the extreme situation. If X is equal to Z. So R square is the perfect explanation between X and Z is the perfect explanation is equal to 100% explanation. So you will get back, right? Uh, so you will get back the OLS variance. Okay, so, so you will get back this, this uh, OLS variance that we had explained above, okay? But now, I want you also to understand, of course, you hope this one to be um, like the highest possible, right? Of course, we would never get it as one, but we will get somewhere, a number between zero and one. Of course, you understand this as this number decreases, right? The variance of the IV or the, the variance of the IV coefficient, which is beta j in this case, would increase. So you're looking to maximize the explanation of uh, the regression of x on z as much as you can. Right, and this is what we talk about, what we call the relevance test. You're trying to pick the z that best explains x, because otherwise, the variance of the IV estimator would increase, which is not a good sign. You want to minimize this as much as you can. But I want you also to note that I want you also to note that since this R square. I know that, that this R square XC is always a number that is most of the time, right? Is always a number um, we never, like, like in practice, we never got a number which is equal to, to one. So it's then one. So because of this um, fact, the variance of the IV is always and this is very important, is always greater than the variance of OLS. And I want you to recall this point that we mentioned in the disadvantages of the IV, uh, if you remember, when we talked about the last disadvantage of the IV and we said that IV gives uh, more attention to consistency, right? 
So it cares more about the upper part of the T statistic and less attention to the high to the high standard error which Z might produce. Okay? So one of the disadvantages of the IV estimation methodology when I compare it with OLS is the fact that the standard error of the coefficient will always be greater than the standard error of the coefficient estimated under OLS. So when I go back here, um, I'm talking about the, low, the lower part of the t-statistic. In the case of the two stage least squares, the standard error, like the standard error of beta j here, right? It's an estimated, and this is the standard error, versus the standard error of beta hat j here. This is under the OLS, this is under the TSLS, will always be greater. And this is not a good sign. And it's not a good sign, it's one part of the estimation, one of the disadvantages of the estimation. And it's not a good sign for, for uh, the characteristic of a coefficient. The TSLS gives more attention to the upper part of the T statistic, and we're gonna talk about this uh, after we're done with the, with the standard error. Okay, anyone has any question? Okay, so this is something to remember all the time, and this is the equation of interest. If this one is equal to one, or if the R square is equal to one, then you go back to the general formula that we know. So this R square XZ is the regression of X on Z, and we always call it the auxiliary regression. So when you see the word auxiliary in one of the, let's say in the regression, in the final exam, you understand that I'm talking, let's say if, I, if you have a question about IV, auxiliary regression of X on Z, I'm talking about the first stage regression of, uh, of X regressed on the, the IV estimator. Okay, let's go to the, the betas, okay, which is the upper part of the Z. So when we talk about the um, the betas, which is beta hat OLS versus beta hat TSLS, right? And I'm talking about bias. So a bias, I'm looking for a coefficient, whether it's OLS or BTSLS, uh, beta TSLS, uh, I'm looking for a coefficient that is hopefully, like the expectation of this coefficient is hopefully equal to the true population parameter. If this happened, then I say it's unbiased, right? Um, and consistency, this beta hat J would converge to beta j, the true one, let's say this is j, this is j, uh, under high probability, and we call this consistency, okay? So now we want to see how these two coefficients perform under this, um, wait, I have, my computer is gonna disconnect right now, I hope not, okay. All right, so, um, so let's start with beta OLS. So we know that beta OLS will be consistent under a certain assumption or under a certain OLS assumption, which is if I have exogenous X or if exogeneity assumption holds, right? So we started topic one by saying that the covariance between Xi and Ui 
is equal to zero. And then later on, we violated this assumption and we tried to see how can we deal with it. And the IV estimation methodology is one way of dealing with it. So the exogeneity assumption is saying that the covariance between Xi and Ui is equal to zero. Now, I can take this Ui and replace it because I know that or substitute it with the value, which is Yi minus beta zero minus beta one Xi, okay? So I can take this uh, equation and substitute it in the covariance and write it this way. The covariance between Xi, Yi minus beta naught minus beta one Xi is equal to zero. Now, there is a comma here. So I have a covariance between X and this part, a covariance between X and this part, and a covariance between X and itself. So I can break this big covariance bracket into three brackets. So I have Xi, Yi, minus the covariance between Xi and a constant, minus the covariance between Xi and itself multiplied by a constant. Okay, so for the first one, we're gonna repeat it. It's the covariance between x i and y i. Now the next part is x i with a constant. A covariance between x and anything constant is simply zero. And the next one is I can take the constant out and write it as the covariance, right, between uh, x i and itself which is again equal to zero. Now I can repeat this one just to remove the zero from here, right? Minus beta. Uh, so the covariance between X and X is the variance, right? So I can just simply write it as the variance. So the variance of X just to make to make our life easier, okay? Now, and then I here I wrote it as beta one, so let me just keep the beta one everywhere so you won't be confused. I can call it beta, but just we note it as beta one. So out of this, I can solve for beta one, right? I can solve for beta one by saying, okay, beta one is the covariance of x i y i divided by the variance. So let me write it in a new slide. So we can say that beta one is simply equal to the covariance. And you know this already, it's the equation that we had on the very first um, uh, lecture on the OLS topic over the variance of X. Okay, I can open this covariance because you already know that any covariance is each between X and Y is each observation minus the mean of x, each observation of yi minus its mean, okay, over, I know that the variance can be written as the distance between each xi from the bar, x bar, which is the mean, squared. From here to here, we can always replace the very last bracket by just yi, and I want you to check if you, uh, like to know because the, this is a, there are a couple of steps here. You can check page 704 of your textbook, okay? And divided by xi minus x bar squared. And then you can come to the conclusion that, okay, beta OLS um, is equal to the sum of xi minus x bar <clears throat> yi over the sum of x i minus x bar. Now, we want to reach something that um, can be compared with the TSLS. So we can keep moving by uh, changing this formula by substituting the value of y i. So you can do so by... Why did you omit the squared term on the bottom? It's right here, yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, we can substitute, as I said, for the yi by saying, okay, the sum of xi minus x bar, 
I can open the yi back here and then say it's beta 1 xi plus ui over, instead of writing the bracket down here, I'm just going to call it variance of x just for simplicity. Okay. And again, these are two brackets. So this bracket is multiplied times beta naught times the second part times the third part. So we can break it into three parts. And the first one is beta naught sum of xi minus x bar. It's beta one, the sum of xi minus x bar xi plus the sum of xi minus x bar ui over the variance of x again, so right? So we're gonna call it variance of x. Next, we're going to take each part and then try to um, like simplify. So for the first one, I want you to note the following. When you think about the sum of xi minus x bar, it's equal to the sum of xi minus nx bar, right? And you know already that, I want to write this here, you know that the x bar is equal to sum of xi over n. In other words, sum of xi is equal to nx bar, right? So you can use this by writing, okay, so this one is nx bar minus nx bar, so this one is equal to zero. So this part is zero. Okay, so you can use this idea in order to simplify, or this fact in order to simplify uh, the formula, and we can write it this way. So, beta naught, oh, sorry. We can write it this way as um, beta naught or beta, okay, let me write for you the zero first, okay, so that you're not confused. Okay, so it's equal to zero, the first part, plus, let's go to the next part, beta one, the sum of xi x bar times xi is simply, let me write it here, so that you have it in front of you, and it's again similar to the idea uh, of page 704 that I told you about to read it. So it's, if I have the sum of xi minus x bar times xi is equal to the sum of xi minus x bar times xi minus x bar, which is simply again the variance of x. So here I can substitute this part by the variance of x. And I can write it, okay, so it's beta one variance of x plus the sum of xi minus x bar, the last component to the last part, ui. And I'm going to again divide everything by the variance of x. Um, I'm sure that you know that the very last part here is, okay, so it's equal to, and remember we're talking about the beta hat of OLS, is equal to, the variance is gonna go with the variance, right? So you cancel each other, I'm left with the beta. Uh, let's call it one, and this is, we call it one. And it's plus the sum of xi minus x bar ui over the variance of x. This is a very important uh, formula, why? Because in the OLS, we assume that this part is zero if exogeneity assumption holds. We basically say the covariance between xi and ui is equal to zero. So if this one is zero, then this is actually the assumption of OLS that beta hat is equal to beta, so we have unbiased coefficient. So if, and let me say this is zero if exogeneity assumption, this assumption by OLS holds, right? So this is the assumption 
Y O L S. So if exogeneity O L S assumption holds. Okay. Um, however, we said that because we violate the assumptions, right? Um, let me start here with a clean one, and we can also write the very last formula in a different, easier way by writing it. Okay, uh, the beta uh, hat one is equal to the beta plus. Let me write this one. You know, this one we can write it as a covariance between x i and u i. And the denominator is simply the variance of x. And I call this one, I can just name it OLS, right? And this is the true OLS, okay? And I know that I can write this covariance, right? I know the co like the formula for the covariance, any covariance, x i u i is equal to the correlation between x i u i multiplied times the standard deviation of x standard deviation of u okay because you know this correlation uh, between um, x and y and we used to write it in x and y is equal to the covariance x and y over the standard deviation of x standard deviation of y so this is what we said in lecture one any computation of the uh, cor uh, co correlation. So if I want to write it in terms of a covariance, then it's basically the correlation times the standard deviation. I can use this and rewrite our equation for the beta hat um, OLS. And we said it's one, okay? Because I, I, I can actually limit anything. And then it's equal to, beta OLS plus, I'm going to remove this covariance and type it in terms of correlation. So I'm gonna write, okay, it's the correlation between X I U I sigma X sigma U over the variance of X. Let me write it in terms of sigma. Okay, so I'm gonna write the variance in terms of sigma X. So this is the variance of x okay which is the same here i'm writing in terms of letters and here i'm writing in terms of sigma so i can cancel one of the x one of the sigmas with the sigma x and i'm left with beta 1 ols plus the correlation between x i u i times sigma u over sigma x and we're done this important formula, we're gonna come back to it when we derive the one related to the two stage least squares. This one, let's call it star, and it's very important. And again, it makes our life easy when we look at this formula in terms of the correlation or in terms of the uh, covariance. And remember that again, if I have the assumption of OLS is right, like it's, if I have um, the exogeneity assumption holds, then this part is gone, right? This whole part is gone. And I'm just left with beta OLS is equal to beta, the true beta, and I have unbiased estimators. And this was like the big assumption of OLS, that this part under the assumption of OLS is equal to zero, okay? But again, because of the different connections that could happen between X and the error term, whether it's omitted variable bias, simultaneous causality, wrong functional form, errors in variables, or I can sum all of these and say specification errors, or the model is invalid, any of these problems would lead to a connection between the X and the error term and would make this correlation non-zero, okay? So we have to have it here and uh, like in the formula and say it's assumed to be equal to zero in the OLS. Okay, so we're going to move in the same steps for the TSLS. It's gonna be faster because we are actually following the same methodology, so I'm not going to be explaining each and every part. 
it's the same methodology, but the assumptions are different. So we're going to uh, go through the details of the formulas and then uh, we're going to be comparing the final outcome of uh, both. So let's start with, again, what is the assumption? So let's uh, say here, this is um, beta hat TSLS, okay? So if I have an exogeneity assumption or exogeneity condition of the IV regression model, it, the, the assumption is like this, the covariance between ZI, my instrument, and UI is equal to zero. So this is the exogeneity assumption under IV regression, right? So under IV regression model, okay? Uh, so they assume or they, the method assumes that I'm going to choose a ZI that is exogenous. And the exogeneity assumption is that there is zero connection between ZI and UI. Again, we're going to move in the same steps. So let's open this UI. UI is equal to YI minus beta naught minus beta one XI equal to zero. Again, I can split this big bracket into three brackets, covariance of ZI, YI, minus the covariance between ZI beta naught minus the covariance between ZI and beta one XI. So this one is here still with us, so it's not equal to zero. This one is zero because the covariance with ZI and a constant term is zero. And then take the coefficient out covariance of ZI with XI is equal to zero. I can substitute for beta. Can you only take the beta though out of the final term if we know that ZI and XI are very highly correlated? Can we take it out? Say that again. So for the final term, we can only take out the constant there because we know that they're highly correlated ZI and XI, right? Not that, that, not that they are highly correlated. Their correlation is non-zero, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, so, and this is part of our assumption, that, that, like the relevance assumption. So we can come to the uh, formula, which is similar to our previous one, ZI, YI, over the covariance, covariance between ZI, XI, okay? And we can make our life simple and say, okay, this is, the IV, and this is one, this is hat, right? This, because it's estimated and we can open this into more details. We can say, okay, it's the sum of ZI minus Z bar. This is the definition of a covariance, YI minus Y bar over the sum of ZI minus Z bar, XI minus X, and we can just come to the last step here and say, okay, I can replace this one by YI. And again, look at page 704 of your textbook. And this one would be the sum of ZI, Z bar, YI over the sum of ZI minus Z bar, XI minus X bar, X bar, okay? And now we're going to do the same thing. We're going now to open this yi. So yi has its own equation. So you know the equation already. And we can just um, replace the yi by its value. So we can say, okay, the beta hat TSLS is equal to I'm going to open the yi into beta naught, beta one xi, and then the error term. So it's equal to beta naught, which is the first part of yi, times zi minus z bar, right? Which is this one, multiplied times the first component of yi, 
and beta 1 sum of zi minus z bar xi plus the sum of zi minus z bar ui. Okay, and then everything in the denominator is exactly the same. Uh, so we still have the zi minus z bar, which is the covariance between x and z. Okay, and then again, I can, I can like simplify this formula by uh, writing this. I know that the sum of zi minus z bar is equal to n z bar minus n z bar is equal to zero. So I can actually get rid of this term. It's equal to zero. What about this term? I know that the sum of z i minus z bar times x i is simply the covariance between the two. I can just replace this one and make my life easy and type it as the covariance between zi and xi, okay? So we can just repeat the formula for the beta hat TSLS by saying that, okay, the first term is zero. The second term is beta one times the covariance between zi and xi and I'm sure that you know that this is actually referring to the relevance between X and the IV plus the sum of ZI. I can actually remove this one. You know this already. I can remove this one and type the uh, covariance between ZI and the error term. So let me do that. Okay, so... I'm just going to write instead of writing it in terms of the sums, I'm going to write it as a covariance. So the very last part can be written as the covariance between zi and the error term. And I'm sure that you know that this is about exogeneity of the IV, and this one is about the relevance of IV. Okay? Uh, and then everything in the uh, denominator which is this part is the covariance between the instrument and X. So this one is the covariance between ZI and XI. XI, okay? Now, we can simplify by saying, okay, so the beta hat one TSLS, the zero is gone, right? So next one here, I have this covariance would cancel with this covariance. So I'm left with beta one plus the covariance between zi ui over the covariance between zi xi. Again, exogeneity relevance, right? So this one is reflecting the relevance and the upper part is reflecting exogenite. So I want you to notice that because we're going to use um, this idea uh, next. So <clears throat> I want you to notice the following. You can, you know this already, the covariance, and let me go back to one of the slides here. Um, the covari I can remove any covariance and write it in terms of correlation times standard deviation. So covariance can be replaced by the correlation times the standard deviations of the coefficients. So I can do that here and here. And I'm going to write it in terms of the, co uh, in terms of the correlation and standard deviation of the coefficients. So we can write it as follows. The beta, we're almost done. Okay, so TSLS is equal to the beta, the true beta under TSLS <clears throat> plus, I'm going to remove the covariance and type it as a correlation between the instrument and the error term times sigma Z, sigma U. And the same thing for the lower part. I'm going to remove the co covariance between Z and X and type it as the co correlation 
between zi xi times sigma z sigma x. And by looking at this formula, I can cancel this one with this one, right? And I'm left with, and this is our <clears throat> uh, final step. TSLS is equal to the beta one TSLS plus the correlation between ZI UI over the correlation between ZI XI times sigma U sigma X. And this is very important formula and we're gonna call it double star. Okay, now I need to compare this double star with the formula we got for OLS, the star. We said that beta OLS is equal to the true beta plus the correlation between X and the error term. And this is about, and you can actually call this one endogeneity problem. Endogeneity problem, which is the connection between the X and the error term, and this indigenity problem is assumed to be zero in the OLS. So we're going to, let me uh, write it again in the last slide so that we have the two in front of us because we have uh, a couple of important uh, Where is it? Okay. So I want to write the other one here. So beta hat one OLS is equal to beta one OLS plus the correlation between or the endogeneity problem XI the error term times sigma U sigma X. So when you look at these two formulas, and try to figure out, okay, what's the difference? If I don't name it uh, TSLS and OLS, so if I just uh, stop here, unbiased coefficient, they are the same, right? Now, so if I don't have any correlations, if I don't have any addition here or any addition here, then they are just OLS is the same as TSLS. However, in real life, we do have endogeneity problem, okay? And we try to correct it by using an instrument that is exogenous and relevant, okay? So when I compare these two formulas, this is formula star versus double star, uh, what is the difference between, what is the main difference between these two? formulas. I have the sigma u is like the sigma u. The sigma x is like the sigma x. The beta is the beta. The hat is the hat. So I actually need to compare the correlations. These are the different parts between the two formulas. Okay. And that's why I'm going to focus on the correlations because the differences in these correlations would make the difference between the betas of TLS versus OLS. So I'm going to write it here. Um, so I, I'm kind of looking between the difference between two things, a correlation or endogeneity problem between XI and UI versus right, the correlation between my instrument and the error term divided by the correlation between my instrument and the endogenous um, variable. Okay, again, I want you to notice you're talking about endogeneity, exogeneity, relevance. Okay, so I want you to note important things. You're kind of comparing these two, right? So I want you to note, like you can keep thinking about these three different variables and you come up with different conclusions, right? So I want you to note that if the correlation 
and this is very important, between x and the error term is, let's say, positive, anything. It's non-zero. Let's assume it's positive. And the correlation between the instrument and x is also positive. And let's say the correlation between z and error term is negative. Okay? If you think about all these combinations, and of course, if it is negative, then it's uh, not like it's not exogenous uh, IV. So I want you to notice the following. In this situation, you have an IV estimated that is biased. Or in other words, or more specifically, the IV estimator uh, will have a downward bias. Right? And both are actually are biased because the, while the OLS has an upward, upward bias. Okay, so if this one is, that's what I'm saying. So if this one is positive, this one is positive, this one is negative. So this whole part is negative. And this part is positive. So what I'm looking here, if everything is exactly the same, this one is negative, like this addition is negative. This one is positive. So this one, the TSLS would, would be smaller, would have a downward bias as compared to the OLS. Because you're taking the true coefficient, you're subtracting from it a certain number. Here you're taking a true coefficient and you're adding to it a certain number. So in this specific assumption, I'm not saying this is gonna happen, but I'm just saying what if. Uh, in this, under the, this assumption, then I'm going to have TSLS that is downward bias, OLS is upward bias. Let's see something else. Uh, what if, what if I have a correlation between ZI and UI and the correlation between XI and UI, they are both positive. However, um, let me, now, let me make it all positive, okay? So I'm just trying to show you something more important actually than the previous case. Okay. Suppose that this one and um, the correlation between ZI and XI is also positive. We are saying that one of the good things about the IV is that it gives more importance to bias, okay? So the, your estimators are supposed to be less biased than the estimators of OLS. So I, if I have these assumptions that all these correlations are, are positive, when can I get the IV to be less biased than the OLS? So the IV bias would only be smaller then OLS, which means it's better if something happens. If this ratio of ZI over UI divided by the correlation between ZI XI is actually smaller than the correlation between XI UI. Okay, so if, if the additional part to the true beta uh, parameter is smaller than the additional part in the OLS, then of course I'm going to have an IV that, is, that has a smaller bias than the OLS. In other words, the bias of IV will be smaller than, uh, than that of OLS, okay? So go back here, okay? So let me just try to clean as much as I can. Just try to clean this whole thing. So the idea is every time you're looking at the bias idea, 
you're trying to see the additional part to each regression, right? So if I'm saying all these correlations are positive, so the sign here is plus, the sign here is plus. However, if this component is, is smaller than this component, then I have the bias here is smaller than here. That's the idea. So, um, I want you to think about this relationship as, like we can write it in a different way. So I can write it just as follows. So I can say, I prefer actually to write it this way, or the correlation between Z, I, and the error term is less than the multiplication of the correlation between X, I, the error term, and the correlation between Z, I, X, I, okay? So if this happens, then I have the bias of I, V is smaller. This is what, that's why we are actually using I, V. We're trying to correct for indigenity problem, and it has the advantage of a smaller bias. So if I can get this, which is just equivalent to this, then I can say the IV has a smaller bias, okay? So uh, let me give you this example. Suppose that, um, just, I'm just gonna give you an example. Suppose that the correlation, and suppose that this is something that you know, okay? Uh, given to you, ZI, xi is equal to a small correlation, 20%. So if I substitute this here, I'm gonna put the 20%, okay? So I'm gonna say that the correlation between zi, ui is equal to 0.2 correlation xi, ui, or the you can think about it this way, the correlation between Z, I, and the error term must be less than 0.2, or you can think of 0.2 is fifth, right? One over five, fifth, or 0.2 of the correlation between X, I, and the error term, so that I can conclude that I, V, estimator can have um, a smaller bias than OLS. That's the idea. You can think of it this way, or can you say, say okay, if you want me to have smaller bias for the IV, okay, I want this to be less than fifth of the correlation between XI and the error term. Right? In other words, get me an instrument that is correlated with the error term that has only fifth the indigenity problem. That's the idea, all right? Okay, so um, anyone has any question? The thing that I want you to remember is the two formulas here. These are very important. And what makes life easy between these two formulas is, is the fact that they are actually the same except for the correlation part. So if I can understand the correlation part and I understand the components of this correlation part and what are the components are telling me, then I can um, easily understand the connection. Uh, the three correlations are talking about the things that we have been talking about since the beginning of the topic. Indigenity problem is corrected by an instrument that is relevant and exogenous. And not any relevance and not any exogenous, it has to satisfy certain criteria, right? We have performed the test last time, we have written the test last time, but this is just uh, a more specifics to what we need to find. So we need to find, let's say, if I can 
find out what is the correlation between the Z and the X, and this is easy to get, then I can understand that this correlation between my instrument and the error term has to be less than the correlation uh, of the Z and X multiplied times the X and the error term or the indigeneity graph. Okay? All right. So any questions before we move to the state part? Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop here in terms of the IV topic. Of course, there are many other things that I want to talk about, but I'm going to limit myself to this. And um, we're going now to, uh, I'm going now to show you how to uh, estimate the model in Stata. And, um, and I'm going to take any questions that you might have. So let me now share with you my desktop. Okay, so so I'm going to I have a quick question before we start this. Yeah, uh, do we still have a quiz tomorrow? Yes, or... we do, and I'm going to be sending you the data set right after the lecture. The and what, what topics quiz, is it going to Yeah, so the quiz yeah. is going to be covering only panel models. And okay. uh, whatever you see now is not part of the quiz. Okay. okay. So I will be sending you panel data set. And uh, yeah, and tomorrow is our last quiz. And the good thing is uh, I've sent you the schedule. So it has everything. So that's why I'm kind of relaxed. You guys know what to expect. So, but I should have, I should send you the data set very soon okay um just um okay so what we're gonna do now is i'm going to show you how to estimate the model in uh, state so let's get the data set so i'm going to be using the auto data set and the auto data set is uh, is about the factors affecting the price of cars. And there are multiple factors here. I'm not gonna use all of them. I just like, I'm gonna make a simple model. Um, some of them are the make of the car, the model of the car, uh, the mileage per gallon, uh, the repair record, uh, the headroom, which is the space above the head, the trucks, the trunk space, the weight, the length of the car, the turn circles, and displacement, gear ratio, car type, and so on. So these are factors uh, affecting, or we're trying to estimate the factors affecting the price of the car. Just a question, will you be posting this code online? Yeah, the code, you're gonna actually have something very similar to it tomorrow. Uh, in the recitation, it's just like a different data set, but it's exactly the same do file. Okay. So, when I have uh, a model or when I'm trying to estimate the price of a car, uh, let's say I have an OLS regression price as a function of the weight, the turn, whether the car is foreign or domestic, the headroom, and so on. Uh, the assumption is, and you're always going to have this assumption given to you, uh, that weight is endogenous. So weight might be related to other factors affecting the price of the car that are not included in this model. So it could be like related to the length of the car. The length of the car is not included in the model. It could be related to any other uh, uh, factor which is not included here. And that's why we consider it as endogenous. The other two factors are considered to be or assumed to be um, uh, instruments. We're going to be used as instruments. And, uh, and other factors, let's say, I should have, okay. And headroom, okay, so headroom is assumed to be exogenous, okay. Now, let's assume, uh, let's start with estimating with an OLS just a regular estimation, you get your results uh, the, for the factors affecting the price. Now, what if I'm sure that weight is 
endogenous in this regression. So I'm trying to find uh, instruments for weight. And the instruments given to you in the question are turn and foreign. So you're going to perform the first stage regression by regressing your X on the two instruments plus the exogenous variable. Okay, so you get your first stage regression. And what you need out of this first stage regression, you want the X hat, right? So you get the X hat by uh, using the predict command. Okay, and then after you do so, you take it, you take this weight hat and you plug it into the second stage regression. Okay, so price, weight hat, headroom. Okay, and this is actually a very simple model. So you estimate your model and you get uh, less biased coefficients. So here it's 1.366, right? And here it was 4.59. So you can see the drop of about three points, right? Or three LBs. And it's kind of uh, showing us that it was, in the OLS, it was um, positive bias or it was upwardly biased and now it has decreased. When you compare the standard error, uh, let me see the standard error here, in the OLS, as you can see, is just 0.619, and here is 0.597. Okay, so I want you to remember that when I told you last time that this standard error is not the correct one. Uh, when I do the two steps manually, the standard error that I get is not the correct one because um, it doesn't correct for the fact that I'm using the estimate of my X variable. So here it's just like thinking that this weight hat is another variable. It's just like, it's not the X hat itself. So I'm going to show you how to correct for that. If I'm doing the all, uh, the all at once, when I do the all at once, I get the correct standard error. So the all at once, you have the IV reg or IV regress, 2SLS, the price, your exogenous variable, and then the endogenous and the two instruments that you have, okay? So when you do that and you have a very similar uh, do file tomorrow, as I said. When you do that, what you get here is the correct standard error, okay? Uh, the IV regress is showing us a coefficient that is similar, it's the same actually, to the one estimated from the two stage least squares, okay? The two steps, I should say, two steps. So this is 1.33, it's the same. And the same thing, minus 2.07, it's the same. So whether I, I'm doing it manually, like two steps or all at once, I get the same estimated coefficients in 0.2 and 0.3, okay? What about the standard error? When I look at the standard error, when I'm doing the standard error here, this is 0.59. This is supposed to be, as I told you in the, no, sorry, this one. Okay, so the IV regress would give me a standard error that is the correct standard error, okay? Uh, however, because it's correcting for the fact that I'm using uh, X hat, okay, which is the weight hat. Here, as you can see, it's bigger. When I do it like manually, I get like a bigger standard error. Okay, so when you try to think which one is the correct one, the IV regress would give me the correct one. Okay, so the standard errors are larger in the step-by-step -step method, okay, because it fails to correct for the fact that I'm using X hat. If I'm trying to, I'm going to show you later how to correct because it's kind of complicated, so I want to leave it till the end. If we don't have time, it's not anyways part of your course, but I'm going to have it for you on the do file um, in tomorrow's uh, recitation. So for the instrument relevance, which is the connection between X and Z, uh, if I'm doing the manually like step, two steps, right? 
uh, the relevance test is all about the first stage regression. So you take your first stage regression and you just type test, which is, or test PRM, whatever you like. All right. And, okay, and then you get the F statistic. And this one is telling us that there is a zero probability that these two are equal to zero. Or in other words, there is a connection between X and the two instruments, okay? So let me just correct this one because here I was using another model. Okay. So you can just, I'm saying here, you can use test or test PRM. You can actually make your result look nicer by extracting the F statistic. You can call it first F or anything, first stage F, anything. And then say, okay, the first stage F statistic can be displayed, okay? And the good news is um, it's more than 10, right? Much higher than 10. And this one is telling us that our instruments are relevant. Okay, so if you look at the p-value, it's just telling us that uh, we reject the null hypothesis, but whether this is above 10 or no, you just look at the t statistic, uh, I mean the f statistic. I have two restrictions and uh, the degrees of freedom, and then it's 75, it's way above 10. Okay, so since the f is less than 10, uh, it's not less. Okay. We conclude that the IVs are relevant. I'm sorry, I hate copy pasting. I was like doing something else. So that's it. Okay, so the instruments, the IVs are relevant. Okay, so this is number one. You can actually, if you're doing the IV regress, you can type the first stage. So a state first stage would uh, give you the same results so when you go here 75 this is the f statistic this is the part that you need to look at so 75.112 right and you're able to get the first stage regression which is almost the same okay uh it's one 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 eight seventy five one one eight seventy five one one eight i have gave extra decimals that's fine Okay, so you can either do it this way manually or you can do it this way, whatever you like. When it comes to the instrument exertionality test, again, I can do it manually or I can use the command instead. So if I do it manually, I, get, I take the IV regress. So I need to extract the error term from the IV regress. Okay, so I estimate the model and I get the error term. And after I do so, so you extract the U hat, you take the U hat, you regress it on the two instruments that you have and the exogenous variable. And then you perform a T statistic. Uh, uh, I keep saying T statistic, an F statistic, okay? And this F statistic is telling us, if I multiply this times 100, there is a 0.28% probability that these are equal to zero. Okay, so there is a very small probability that these are equal to zero. So you compute the J statistic to find out whether these are exogenous or not. So the J statistic, you extract the F and you multiply it times two because uh, I have two instruments and I have that explanation here and this is same explanation, you will see it tomorrow because I just have the same model, I mean the same do file, but just for diff with using different data set. So the J statistic is equal to J, um, equal to M, which is the number of instruments times F, okay? And now I need to compute the p-value. So the p-value with um, Q minus one degrees of freedom, so you have one, then you can display everything. So the display of the J, the P, the chi-square critical value, and let's see, okay? So the J statistic is equal to 12.79. The p-value of the J statistic is equal to this number. The critical value, so chi-square critical value for one degrees of freedom is 3.84. So the 12 is much higher than the 
right? So what you do is that you actually reject the null hypothesis that the instruments have zero connection with the error term and you say they are actually not exogenous. So let me just correct this quickly because, um, where is it? Uh, is higher, it's not much lower because I, I, the one that you see tomorrow is different, is higher. Uh, so we reject, right? The non-hypothesis uh, of the exigeneity of instruments and the conclusion, the instruments are not exogenous okay so we got a number for the j statistic that is actually 12 exceeding the 3.4 it's in the rejection region so i'm rejecting the null that the instruments are exogenous and that's it right uh, now let me show you how we can do it one step so I can, as I said here, I got the F statistic, I multiply it times the instrument to get the J statistic and that's it. Now, I can actually do a state over ID, okay? When I type state over ID, I can get the J statistic. I have two different versions of the J statistic. I have the Sargent one and I have the Bassman one. Just look, we are using this one, which is the one that, um, uh, manually so here's 12.79 and it's exactly the same as the one we got here okay so the Bassman one is the one uh, computed here next so you can either use this one or this one now what if I have an exactly identified model if I have an exactly identified model m is equal to k you have an option to do that you just type iv regress to sls y x equal to z the command that you need to um, check for exogeneity is called state endogenous so let's see here I tried it with just one instrument turn instead of turn and foreign and this one would give me the estimation results for using just one IV. Just notice that the null hypothesis is saying that the variables are exogenous. So what I get from here is again a zero probability. It's on like it's very small, right? 0.23% probability that the null is true. Okay, so that means again the instrument by itself, turn by itself, is endogenous so I cannot use it so when you have an exam and I'm asking you um, are the instruments valid so you basically say no because uh, for a valid instrument I need to have it as relevant and exogenous now I have the instruments used are yes relevant but they are not exogenous accordingly I can say that these instruments are invalid okay or weak and what's the solution the solution is to just go and look for another uh, set of instruments that you can use, or you probably can choose another estimation methodology uh, other than IV that is not uh, sensitive to the weak instruments uh, problem. And this is of course outside the scope of your course. Uh, how to fix the standard error? So let me um, talk about this next time. So I'm gonna start next week lecture by five minutes just talking about this part. It's not part of your uh, course, uh, but this is just for your own learning. So you can, ha you have actually this part again in tomorrow's um, do file. So um, you can check it, uh, like you can try to understand it, but anyways, I'm going to go over it on Tuesday. And next week is going to be our last week. So we have two more lectures to go and we're going to start time series or an introduction to time series on Tuesday of next week. Okay. Uh, again, I'm going to be sending you the data set for tomorrow's quiz. And again, it's a panel uh, data set. All right. Any questions? Okay, so I'll see you on Tuesday and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.